We're delighted that you're worshiping online with the Goochland Baptist family today. Today, we're concluding our sermon series, King Jesus, where we've been considering what it means to make Jesus the king of our entire lives. And today, we're talking about our relationship with wealth. It's our hope that you'll hear the loving call of Jesus in your own life as we worship together today. Thanks so much for joining us. This morning comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, and I invite you to follow along as I read aloud. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
My attention was perked this week as I read about a pastor who admitted that he was part of a cult. Not a cult like the Branch Davidians or the Moonies, but a cult that's much more widespread in its influence. I belong to the cult of the next thing, Pastor Mark Buchanan wrote. And it's dangerously easy to get enlisted, he said. It happens by default, not by choosing the cult, but by failing to resist it. The cult of the next thing is consumerism, cast in religious terms. It has its own litany of sacred words. More, you deserve it. New, faster, cleaner, brighter. It has its own deep-rooted liturgy. Charge it, instant credit, no down payment, deferred payment, no interest for three months. It has its own preachers, evangelists, prophets, and apostles. They're admin, pitchmen, celebrity sponsors. It has, of course, its own shrines, ch chapels, temples, and meccas. They're malls, superstores, club warehouses. It has its own sacraments, too, credit and debit cards. It has its own ecstatic experiences, the spending spree. The cult of the next thing's central message proclaims, Crave and spend, for the kingdom of stuff is here. Now, as I read Pastor Buchanan's words, I reflected upon my own life, and maybe I'm part of the cult of the next thing, too, I began to think. It's hard not to be. And we, as a society, salivate over bigger, better, and more sophisticated. I mean, heck, some of us salivate just at the thought of a steady income. After all that our economy has been through this year, some of us find ourselves strapped for cash. But the truth is, just about all of us, whether we're financially blessed or financially strapped, we all find ourselves tempted by the allure of wealth. Now, let's be honest. I mean, money can be helpful, right? It can buy us the things we want. It gives us the opportunity to try new things. It, it even brings us a sense of security. I mean, in today's world, we need money to function. And that's what makes Jesus' statement all the more startling. You cannot serve God in money, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24. Now, the Greek word for money in this verse is actually mamona, and it's translated differently in different translations of the Bible. Some Bibles, like the New International Version, translate it as money. Others, like the New American Standard Version, translate it as wealth. The King James Bible simply says you cannot serve God and mammon. But they all mean the same thing. We cannot serve God and wealth. Now, let's be clear. I mean, wealth in and of itself is not sinful. I mean, the Bible even suggests that money can be good. I mean, throughout the New Testament, we see wealthy followers of Jesus giving of their wealth to support Jesus and the church. And our church today is here because people like you and me have given out of our wealth to make this possible. And we rely on your continued gifts to this church to help us minister effectively in our community. But while the Bible makes clear that wealth in and of itself is not sinful, it also makes clear that wealth can lead to sin when we put our trust in our wealth, when we make our wealth our king instead of Jesus. And that is where the danger is. Because everyone today, it seems, from our politicians to the lottery officials to our wealth managers, all say the same thing. Money is the answer. Wealth brings opportunity. The more you have, the more secure you'll become. But when we make wealth our treasure, it becomes an idol. And we've been deceived you can't serve God and wealth, Jesus says. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense because God and wealth require two completely different mindsets. I mean, wealth requires focusing on me, what I can count, what I can stockpile, what I can track. God invites us to focus on others, 
how we can serve them and encourage them and help them. I mean, God and wealth pull us in two fundamentally different directions. And that's vital for us to remember because wealth is an equal opportunity deceiver. Whether we've got a lot or a little, wealth's allure is the same. As the billionaire John D. Rockefeller supposedly replied when asked the question, how much is enough? The answer seems to always be one dollar more. And that is deceptively dangerous. And that's because wealth or possessions or stuff, whatever you want to call them, they all promise the same thing that Christ promises us. Security. Hope. A future. Advertisers communicate this all the time, that if we just have their product, we'll find the joy and security or the esteem that we've always wanted. You may remember a Kool-Aid commercial from some years ago. It, it pictured several sullen children just sitting around outside on a gorgeous summer day. But these children are so bored that they become completely numb to the beauty that surrounds them. They're not talking aloud, but their faces all say the same thing. Life is so boring. Why do we even bother? But then... A woman walks out with this clear glass pitcher filled with iced down red Kool-Aid. And the kids wake up instantly. Their faces light up. They jump for joy. They run around cheering. Yes, this is what we live for, their smiles seem to say. And that's exactly what the commercial wants you to believe that there's something redemptive about a glass of Kool-Aid, something that brings joy and purpose to our lives that will long outlive the moment. But when was the last time you actually tried Kool-Aid? I mean, I've never known anyone whose life has been changed by a glass of Kool-Aid, much less in the way that the commercial portrayed these children's transformation. And that's because it doesn't happen. The commercials are lies. Whether it's a new phone, a new car, a new house, or a new spouse, the excitement always wears off. The phone becomes outdated in several months, the car gets a scratch on the side, the house requires maintenance, and the spouse turns out to be human too, flawed like the rest of us. Wealth and possessions are seductive, but they never deliver. They always leave us hungry and wanting more. Like I said last week, though, when we make Jesus our king, he always offers us a way out, a path forward. He gives us choices that we can make that will take us off of the path to destruction and put us back on to the path to life. And he does that in this morning's text, too. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, Jesus says. Now what what might it mean for us to store up treasures in heaven? Jesus never directly identifies what they are, but he gives us real clues. When Jesus says that treasures in heaven cannot be destroyed by moth or vermin, he's suggesting that they aren't possessions like clothes or even fields of crops, which can be eaten away by pests. When he says that treasures in heaven can't be stolen by thieves, he's suggesting that our treasures in heaven are not physical possessions or physical things that we can actually hold like gold or precious jewels. It seems like Jesus is saying that the real treasures in life aren't objects that we can physically possess. Now, some scholars have suggested that the real treasures in life are things that we do our faithful acts of obedience. And if you stub your Bible open and you look directly above this morning's text, Jesus has just been talking about giving to the needy, about prayer and about fasting. And we can make a strong case that this is exactly what Jesus is talking about, faithfully following him and serving others. But I think Jesus is talking about more than just good works. 
I think Jesus is looking deeper. I think he's talking about the condition of our hearts. Because our heart represents who we truly are on the inside, who we are at our core. It represents what drives us, what guides our lives. And Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? I mean, what keeps you up at night these days? What's the driving force in your life right now? Are you seeking earthly treasures or heavenly treasures? The message of Jesus is this, that the security that you long for, the meaning that you're chasing, the sense of belonging that we all aspire to, none of this will ever ultimately be realized by our wealth or our possessions or anything material. If we want security, if we want meaning in our life, if we want to belong to something that's lasting, store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Seek after Jesus with everything that we have because the security he brings and the meaning he offers, the belonging that Jesus promises, they may not look exactly like what the cult of the next thing offers, but ultimately they'll outlive any temporary thrill or perk that wealth may bring. God always provides for those who seek him first. One of the real honors of my job is performing funerals for the saints from our church family who've gone on to be with the Lord. And I didn't know her for very long before she passed away, but I'll never forget my time with Margaret Harris, or Granny Harris as she was affectionately known. The story goes that somehow her Sunday school class was talking about investments on a Sunday morning, and Granny Harris piped in and said, My investments are my children because I'd rather have a loving family than all the money in the world. Mrs. Harris seems to have discovered the truth of what Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That when we set our heart on the things of Jesus, that we, when we stop serving our own interests, and instead we seek the things of Jesus, like love and generosity, justice, forgiveness, and grace, then we'll find security and meaning and belonging that all of us crave. Because according to Jesus, the relentless pursuit of wealth will always leave us wanting. But when we pursue heavenly treasures, when we seek first God and His righteousness, then we'll be given everything we need. May God give us all the grace to discover that truth too and to seek first God's kingdom with everything that we have. Let us pray. Loving God, your son Jesus Christ promises that as we seek him, we'll find everything that we need. God, this morning we come to you asking for forgiveness when we've sought the meaning and the purpose and the joy that you offer in things outside of you, particularly in money or wealth. Or possessions. God, forgive us for the ways that we have sought life in what we own. Help us to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Show us ways that we can seek the things of Jesus, that we can be people of love and generosity and grace. How we can work for truth and righteousness and justice and how we can seek first the kingdom of heaven. God, as we do that, God, I pray that we would bless those around us, that you would use us to be a beacon of your light and your hope so that our community and our world may know that true life comes in you and you alone. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us online this morning. I want to say a quick moment to remind you of some of the outreach opportunities uh, that we have coming up. Uh, so we are collecting gently used um, duffel bags and suitcases uh, for the Dover Baptist Association. Um, these are for children who are in the foster care system. Most of the times when they 
uh, when they're moving, they don't have uh, bags or anything. They're usually about using trash bags. So um, if you have any gently used uh, duffel bags or suitcases, um, uh, please bring them. And we were collecting those through uh, next Sunday, November 29th. Um, also, we are um, excited about the Caritas uh, table kits. Um, if you haven't picked, if you haven't purchased one yet, um, there's three extras available on a first come first serve basis. Um, and if you have purchased one and haven't uh, mailed, sent in your check yet, um, yeah, please do that by today. Um, and if you have any questions about this, you can contact Myla Spalding. Uh, also with the t Caritas table kits, we'll be having a, a group build next Sunday, November 29th from two to 4 p.m. And this will be in the multi-purpose room and will be socially distanced, spaced out, and masks will be required for this event as well. Uh, so we hope to see you there. Um, and we also hope that we are able to see you this morning for indoor worship at, at 10 a.m. So I um, look forward to worshiping together this morning. As always, we are grateful for the ways that our church family has continued to um, give during this difficult season. And um, if you're able to give, you can do that um, by giving online. Um, you can send in your offerings in the mail, or there's even a mail slot in the side door of the church office now as well. Uh, wherever you are this week, know that we are praying for you. Take care and God bless.